The high desert of the West may seem empty, but it is home to diverse and abundant wildlife that rely on its unique ecosystem. The sage grouse is the most famous species to make its home there and nowhere else. This grouse is elegantly adapted to its harsh environment, a superb representative of its sagebrush habitat. It was June, 1805. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark were near the confluence of the Marias and Missouri Rivers in present-day Montana. Lewis wrote in his journal, I saw a flock of mountain cod, or a large species of heath hen, with a long pointed tail, which the Indians informed us were common to the Rocky Mountains. Lewis and Clark continued to write about sage grouse in their journals including a 500-word description on March 2, 1806, that provided information about their distribution in the West. Every spring, male sage grouse gather on an open piece of ground known as a lek to perform an elaborate display to attract female sage grouse. Only a few dominant males breed. And competition for this right is intense. Male grouse, also called boomers, begin to show up on the lek as early as January. Females do not appear until late March. The majority of the breeding takes place from late March to the middle of April. Cockbirds still strut on the lek up until May. Arrowheads found on sage grouse leks in Wyoming are silent testimony to Native Americans' dependence on the birds over millennia. Strutting commences at early dawn and finishes shortly after sunrise. These strict strutting hours are most likely because of the attacks of golden eagles. Golden eagles are familiar with lex and the strutting sage grouse are an easy target. Sage grouse often strut all night during a full moon. This boomer is missing half his tail, most likely from the strike of a golden eagle. Males can weigh over six pounds 
they are easily double the size of the hens. In a stable population, hens outnumber males three to one. But when populations decline, the ratio of hens to cockbirds may even be higher. The nest is placed under a sage. Eight to nine eggs is a normal clutch. Chicks hatch around the first of June. Many predators prey on grouse. Ravens eat their eggs. Badgers also eat eggs as well as coyotes and fox. During late incubation, the hens may also be killed because of their reluctance to leave the nest. Sage grouse depend on sagebrush for everything. Nesting cover, camouflage for the young chicks, and the nutrient rich forage they need to survive. Sage grouse chicks are precocial, meaning they feed themselves. They rely on the hen for warmth and protection. Spring rain is critical for chick survival, providing insects and forbs. During times of drought, the hen must move her chicks. The further she must move them to moisture, the higher the mortality. Male sage grouse play no part in the rearing of the chicks. Ferruginous hawks are common in the high desert, feeding mainly on Wyoming ground squirrels. Sage grouse chicks hide motionless while harriers circle above. I have seen hens chase and do battle with northern harriers to protect their chicks. A prairie falcon brings a Wyoming ground squirrel to feed her young. Red-tailed hawks rely on the numerous ground squirrels, as well as ferruginous hawks. Here a ferruginous hawk swallows a ground squirrel whole.
This hen provides shelter and warmth to protect her young from the pouring rain. Chicks require insects and forbs during this critical growth period to provide enough protein for their rapidly growing bodies. It is interesting to note that female survival of the chicks is much higher than males. Males are larger and more gangly, and if predation occurs on the brood, the males are most likely to be taken. In late summer, broods join together to form small flocks and also began eating more on sage leaves. The high desert of Wyoming has only 60 frost-free days a year, July and August. It is during these months that sage-grouse rely heavily on water sources. They prefer drinking in open areas where they can keep a lookout for predators. By mid-August, the young have become strong flyers.
Once snow arrives, grouse are set free from their reliance on water sources. Being able to feed on snow makes them evenly hydrated and makes them much stronger. Unlike many other gallinaceous birds, sage grouse flourish during the winter months. By December, grouse begin to gather in large flocks in traditional wintering areas. Sage grouse are powerful flyers. They can fly 70 miles per hour in long straight flights, allowing them to escape golden eagles and other predators. Winter sage grouse flocks can number in the thousands. It is interesting to note that the majority of the birds in the flock are hens. Only exception are immature boomers from the brood the year before. Adult boomers stay in smaller groups generally 12 to 30 birds, but in times of high population I have seen boomers group up as many as a hundred in a group. In late January, the males begin to posture in preparation for the upcoming breeding season. Barbed wire fences in sage grouse wintering areas can create real problems. The largest mortality I have recorded was 70 dead birds on one stretch of fence. I had to do something to correct this terrible problem. I began placing aluminum cans attached to the fence with a hog ring. These made the fence much more visible to the grouse. Wyoming Game and Fish sage grouse biologist Tom Christensen undertook a study to help resolve the problem of fence strikes in sage grouse.
I remember in 2006 hunting in sand draw. It was unbelievably wild and beautiful, and today it is the home of the largest natural gas field in America. The habitat and the sage grouse who lived there represented the best of America. Wild, unbroken space that characterized freedom and all we hold dear. <laughs> the high desert of Wyoming is one of the last strongholds of the sage grouse. This land is magical and full of life. Many who speed along the roads through this sagebrush sea think there is nothing there. Sage grouse represent all that is wild and unchanged. They live in one of North America's last tracts of undeveloped land. It is truly pristine wilderness. A feeling of sadness comes over me when I see stakes and red flags meaning that this beautiful wilderness is slowly being turned into an industrial land. We can only blame ourselves. To most Americans, it's just sagebrush. <laughs>